or g'day and welcome to the channel. If you own a Canon mirrorless body, you may have a feature that you're not even aware of. What is it? If you have a look at the top dial, you'll see the letters FV. FV stands for Flexible Priority Exposure Mode. Today, I'm gonna to explain exactly what that is, how to use it, and then go out into the field and show you how I've used it. I believe once you learn about this feature, you might find it revolutionizes the way you set your exposure on your camera. So before I launch into what FV mode is, I really wanna just do a quick refresher on what exposure is. What is the shutter speed, aperture, ISO? How do those things work? How does auto exposure work? If you wanna just jump straight into FV mode, I'll put a time on the screen here and we can go from there. But first, let's have a chat about exposure. Take an actual photo, your camera needs a certain amount of light to hit the sensor. Otherwise, it's gonna be really dark, like this image on the screen. Can you even tell what sort of bird that is? No, because it's just too dark. We didn't get enough light hitting the sensor to expose the photo properly. So if we increase the amount of light, then we can expose photos like this beautiful tomtit. That is, it's not too dark and it's not too light. So how do we let more light in to hit the sensor? Well, there's two important exposure settings that change how much light reaches that sensor. The first one is our aperture, and the second one is our shutter speed. Those two settings dictate how much light reaches our sensor, nothing else. So by changing those, we change how much light hits our sensor. All right, so let's start with aperture. Aperture refers to the opening in the lens that allows in light. The amount of light that that lens lets in is measured in stops, and it's represented by a number. So you can see on the screen the common aperture numbers. Between each stop, we're either doubling the amount of light or halving the amount of light that reaches the sensor. Now it gets a little bit confusing, but it's probably easiest if I just grab two lenses and explain what we mean. So this lens here, 405.6. So it has a 5.6 max aperture. That's how fast this lens is. This one here, RF 100 to 400, F8. So F8, it's got a higher number. That eight is one stop higher than 5.6. Because it has a higher number, it lets in less light. How much less light? Well, it's one stop difference, so half the amount. So this lens lets in half the amount of this lens. And we go all the way down to F11, F22, etc. And every stop, we're reducing the amount of light that reaches that sensor. All right, but the confusing thing is the size of these lenses. So let's have a look at this big lens behind me. This is the 500 F4. So its max aperture is F4, so it's quite fast. It lets in quite a lot of light, but it's absolutely enormous. This lens is huge. It's 500 millimeters and it's F4. The odd thing is, is that this lens here is F4, but this lens here is also F4. <laughs> Why is there such a big difference between the two lenses when they let in the exact same amount of light? Well, it all has to do with the focal length. This lens here is 500 millimeters. This lens is 100 millimeters, so there's a big difference. Generally, the longer the focal length, the bigger the opening needs to be to let in the same amount of light. So it's a little bit confusing, but that's why those big lenses are just so expensive. But when we look at these lenses by Canon, this 800 f11, so this lens here has an aperture of f11, which is obviously a lot slower than the f4, even though it's a longer focal length of 800 millimeters, it's a much smaller lens because of that aperture opening. So the aperture generally dictates the price of the lens, like the faster the aperture and the focal length, the more expensive it's gonna be. So the second setting which determines how much light reaches our sensor is what's called our shutter speed. And in DSLRs and even most of these mirrorless bodies, they have what's called a shutter mechanism inside them, which has curtains which restrict the amount of light that gets to the sensor. They basically open up and let in a certain amount of light based on your shutter speed. So if we had a shutter speed of one second, these curtains open, and they let in one second worth of light. If we had a really fast shutter speed, like say one two thousandth of a second, those curtains are literally only letting in one two thousandth of a second worth of light. And as you can imagine, that's only a very small amount of light hitting that sensor. If the shutter speeds are too low, like one second, we're gonna capture quite a bit of movement and the image is gonna be slightly blurry. So for wildlife in particular, we often want quite high shutter speeds to freeze the action. The issue with that, we're not getting a lot of light hitting the sensor. And it's that combination of shutter speed and aperture which ultimately determines your exposure and how much light reaches your sensor. This is probably easiest if we just do an example of some different lenses. So if I grab my 500 f4, let's start with this one. So we've got a 500 f4. Let's say we had an ISO of 100, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, 
and we had a shutter speed of one two thousandth of a second. So really, really fast at f4 results in a really good exposure. So f4, one two thousandth good exposure. Next, we get this lens, 405.6. So the aperture is 5.6. Now remember, that's slower than f4, so half the amount of light. So for this lens in the same light, we actually have to use a shutter speed of one one thousandth. So that's one stop difference. One two thousand, one one thousand, because we've lost the light through that aperture. Next, we've got f8. So f8 is one stop slower than this one. So we need to halve that light again, or halve the shutter speed. So we go from one one thousandth down to one five hundredth of a second at f8. And then finally, we move on to the slowest lens that I have. This one is the 800 f11. Now we have to halve the light again. So we went from one five hundredth of a second, we need to halve it. Now we go down to one two fiftieth of a second. So at one two fiftieth of a second at f11, <laughs> this lens here will have the same exposure as this one at f4 and one two thousandth of a second. So hopefully you can see this slow f11 lens just doesn't let in a lot of light. So we have to use a really slow shutter speed to get that same exposure. Whereas this fast f4 lens, we can use one two thousand, one two fifty. And that's how our aperture and our shutter speed vary. And you just have to be aware of that. What do we do if we want to use this lens and we want to use a shutter speed of one two thousandth? But I've just said you've only got a shutter speed of one two fiftieth. Well, that's where our third setting comes in, and that is your ISO. You've probably heard of ISO. The easiest way to explain it is it's just the way to brighten your images. It doesn't actually impact the amount of light that comes in and hits your sensor. It's basically just brightening the image that you've already taken. So for this image here, if we wanted to take one two thousandth of a second, we need to increase that ISO. Now the ISO works in stops, just like your aperture and your shutter speed. So the base ISO on most cameras is around 100. It varies from camera to camera, but on Canon, the base ISO is 100. So we need to double that number to actually increase it by a stop. So if we go from ISO 100 to ISO 200, 200 to 400, 400 to 800, etc. This lens here is three stops slower than this one. So I need to go ISO 100 to 200, 200 to 400, and 400 to 800. So if I dial in ISO 800, I will actually be able to use a shutter speed of one two thousandth like this one. However, we now are using that much higher ISO. That can cause some issues because there is a consequence to increasing your brightness or that ISO, and that is noise or grain. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. So we just need to be aware as we increase that ISO, it often also increases the noise and the grain in your images. Now, the point at which it becomes an issue for you, the noise that is, varies from camera to camera. If I look at my original 40D, this is a Canon 40D APS-C 10 megapixel body, I used to go to about ISO 400, and above that, I used to struggle a little bit with noise, so 800 to 1600. Whereas the new cameras, say the R5, the R6, you, yeah, you can push that to ISO 3200, 64, 12, 8 without too much issue, mainly because the sensors are so much better. But we also now have software like Topaz Denoise or DxO Pure Raw that removes a lot of that noise for us. Just be aware though, as we increase that ISO, we can lose dynamic range as well. And uh, the much higher ISOs will degrade your image quality. All right, so now that we understand what our aperture, our shutter speed, and our ISO do, we need some way to tell the camera what settings to use. And these modern cameras are just amazing. You have lots of different ways of doing that. You have auto exposure modes and you have manual mode. So the common auto exposure modes on modern cameras is aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual plus auto ISO. And they all do slightly different things. If we start with aperture priority, you basically set the ISO and the aperture, and the camera will automatically choose the shutter speed. How is it automatically doing that? Cameras have a meter in them that measures the amount of light being reflected back in them, and they're always trying to get to what's called middle gray. And they will adjust that shutter speed to get to middle gray, and that's how it works. Now, if I went to shutter priority, and that one we set the shutter speed, the ISO, and the camera chooses the aperture, not as common uh, as aperture priority, but um, some people do use that for bird and flight and different things. And the final one is manual plus auto ISO. It's a bit of, a little bit misleading. It's not actually a manual mode. It's just the terminology. It's an auto exposure mode. 
by far the most common. We set the shutter speed and the aperture and the camera chooses the ISO for us. I believe this is probably the best one because our shutter speed and our aperture control our exposure and the ISO controls the brightness. So the camera is just purely making the image brighter or darker for us. Now, the other one is manual mode and that's when we control all of the inputs. People find this a little bit confusing because if the light changes, you have to change one of those inputs. It used to be quite difficult on a DSLR to do that, but on a mirrorless body with an electron viewfinder, manual mode is much, much easier than it used to be. We've got a histogram and the brightness of the image in the viewfinder it tells us whether the image is too bright or too dark. Which one you use is entirely up to you, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. If you can achieve a good exposure, then that's the right one. However, we're here today to talk about FV mode. What makes FV mode so special is it actually incorporates all those four modes I just mentioned into one single mode. Yep, that's right, FV mode does everything. You can do AV, you can do TV, you can do manual plus auto or ISO, you can do manual mode all from within FV. So to demonstrate how FV mode works, I've actually got my mate Gary the Galar. Let's set up the camera, I'll put my monitor on and I'll quickly go through exactly how it works. So make sure FV is selected on the dial. On the R5 it will work slightly different. You'll have to push a couple of the buttons to get it to work. Now when we enter FV mode, you can see on the left hand side it says TV and that's our shutter speed. The next one over is AV which is our aperture. The next one over, this is our exposure compensation. This is where we make the image brighter or darker in an auto exposure mode. And to the right of that, we have our ISO. All right, so those are our four inputs that we need to control. When we use AV mode or any of these other modes, we have to assign those settings to either dials or buttons or a combination. It can be a little bit confusing, especially if we're switching modes. In FV mode, we can control every single input through two dials. So on the R7, we have the rear dial. On the R5, the R6, it'll be your rear top dial. That moves between the different settings or inputs. So on the screen here, you can see on the ISO, on the far right hand side, you'll see that little symbol next to it, which actually stands for the front control dial. What that means is I can change the ISO just by changing this dial, but I'm just going to focus on moving between the different settings at the moment. So I'm currently on ISO, auto ISO. With the rear dial, I just move that to the left and you can see how the icon has now moved to the exposure compensation. If I want to go to aperture, I move it one more to the left. We're now at T uh, aperture. If I want to move one more to the left to shutter speed, I can do that. So basically I can just go cycle between those four inputs just by turning the rear dial. So I can access whichever one I want to change just by purely changing it through this rear dial, which is pretty cool. So for example, at the moment, I've got it set up as auto ISO. So it's technically like manual or plus auto ISO. So the ISO is in an auto mode. We've got the aperture and the shutter speed. So if I wanted to change that shutter speed, say I wanted to go to 250th of a second, I can just change it with the front dial. So any changes are made with the front dial. If we were to focus, I'm at an ISO of 10,000, which is pretty high. But if I wanted to turn that shutter speed down, obviously I can do that. If we wanted to change the aperture, we just change it over to the aperture and we can change the aperture just with the front dial. Now, if I wanted to change the exposure compensation, we simply move over there. You can see now I'm currently at uh, positive one and one third, meaning that the camera is actually getting it wrong. So if I went back to what the camera um, said it should be, that there is middle gray for the camera, but it's just too dark. We can see that by the histogram, which is a really handy feature in an EVF. At the moment, it's telling me the majority of the pixels are sort of in the middle or towards the left. To get a correct exposure, we want those pixels further to the right. So in the exposure compensation using the dial, I just increase it until we're not hitting the right hand side. That looks like a pretty good exposure to me. I am happy with that. So now we say we want to shoot in an aperture priority. That is, we want to set the ISO, we want to set the aperture and just let the shutter speed flow. I can simply just go over to the ISO. So now I'm on ISO, make some changes here. Let's go, we'll choose ISO 6400. As you can see now, it's way too bright because we're kind of in a manual mode at the moment. So I need to jump over to TV mode and make that the auto or what the camera is going to change. So just using the rear dial, I just go over to TV mode. And a quick tip, if you want to just quickly change a setting into auto, just hit the trash button on the back of the camera. So if I hit trash, 
we're now in TV mode or to, uh, aperture priority mode, even though we're in FV mode, it basically means that the shutter speed is going to change based on the ISO and the aperture that we set. So it's quite simple just to go, you know, to these different things and just change it to whatever you want. If we wanted to shoot in just manual, I can just simply take it out of there and, you know, I can set the shutter speed of say 1 60th. Um, we're still a touch bright there. And so if I wanted to turn down the ISO, I could and away we go. So you can shoot in manual mode or any of the modes. It's just amazing, really. Now, what you may notice is when I go into an auto exposure mode, so I'll just hit the trash can and we'll set it back to auto. You'll see when we, the exposure compensation mode, you can see in the next one, it actually has like a ring logo next to it. You might be wondering what that is. Even though I'm in an FV mode, I can still assign different settings to other things on the camera. So for example, if you use the control ring on the lens to control your exposure compensation, that will still work in FV mode. So I don't actually have to go on to exposure compensation. So even though I'm on ISO, I've got the dial on ISO, I can just quickly change the exposure compensation still with that front dial if you wanted to. And on say the R6 or the R5, you've got an extra control ring on the back of the camera. You could assign that to whatever you wanted, shutter speed, ISO, and you can access that there as well and have the flexibility. So it's sort of the best of both worlds in regards to that. I must admit the R7, I actually prefer the way FV mode works on the R7 because it's quite intuitive for my thumb to be on this rear control dial. It's a little bit more awkward on the R5 and the R6. But the fact that we can just use two dials and it makes manual for me easier on the R7 because we don't have three dials on the R7, we only have two. So I almost prefer FV mode for manual on the R7 just seems to work more intuitively for me. Now the other beauty is, is that we can obviously just look through the viewfinder. We don't need to take our eye off the viewfinder to change any one of those settings. We can just use that rear control dial and the front dial to change whichever setting we want. Now I know trying these different modes can be extremely confusing, especially if you've shot in AV mode for your entire career or manual plus auto ISO. We don't like changing our fingers know where to go. However, I implore you to give FV mode a go. It might change your life. I was reluctant. I have not used it, but a member said to me, Dwayne, it's changed how I shoot. You have to try it. It works amazing on the R7. So I took that advice. I'm trying it myself. I actually went out into the field with the R7 and I want to share that with you. I'm going to share you how I set the exposure, what settings I used, why I chose them, and there's a few other tips as well. So I'm sure you'll enjoy this in the field component where I'll talk you through how I got these shots. Okay, so I headed out into the field and I was using my Canon R7 and my 500 f4 with a 1.4 converter. So that gave me a lens of 700 5.6. With the crop factor, we had 1120 millimeters field of view, which in hindsight was actually way too much, but that's what we went into the field with. Now I got there early, the sun hadn't even come up yet. I had some fairly tame ducks, so this was gonna be perfect for me to take some photos. The first problem I had was we didn't have any light. So I need to make a choice. What shutter speed do I set when I don't have light? Well, I'm kind of, my hand is forced by the moving ducks. Because these ducks are swimming, I have to set a shutter speed that's gonna capture that action. So I went with 1 500th of a second, which to me is quite low for movement, but it should be enough to at least capture the action of the ducks just swimming by. So I had to use 1 500th of a second. When it came to my aperture, it was a bit of a no-brainer. I want as much light as I can get because we don't have any. So I set the maximum aperture, which was 5.6 because I had that converter on. So at 1 500th and 5.6, so I had ISO set to auto, so on auto exposure mode, and the camera told me that it was a ISO of between 2500 and 4000, which is okay considering the situation that we're in. So I've initiated eye tracking, I've followed the duck as it was swimming around, rattling off a number of shots, and we managed to get this shot of the Pacific black duck. Now when we zoom into the duck, you'll see that it does have quite a bit of noise and the image is lacking detail. Now this is to be expected purely because the amount of light that we're letting in to hit the sensor. And this is something that beginners probably struggle with a little bit. They take photos in low light and then wonder why the images aren't sharp or they're lacking detail. It's not your camera, it's not the lens. This lens is thousands of dollars. It's purely because we didn't have enough light hitting the sensor. We just can't get around that. That's just the way it is. So this detail that we're seeing in this duck is to be expected at that shutter speed and that aperture with that amount of light. However, I decided to use DxO Pure Raw on the raw file to remove some of that noise. I've processed it in Lightroom and Photoshop, and this is the end result. 
which I'm pretty happy with considering the amount of light that we have. Now the obvious issue with this photo is it's just too tight. The bird is too big in the frame and that's because I was using a prime. I could have taken off the teleconverter but it was wet, it was muddy, I didn't fancy taking the teleconverter off in those conditions so I just put up with the extra focal length. Canon, I really do want you to bring out a 500mm lens with a built-in teleconverter like Nikon has with their 600. I would love to have a built-in teleconverter. But that situation we worked out well, the FV mode worked fine. So the next opportunity I spotted were two wood ducks and I was actually sort of walking towards the lake when out of the corner of my eye I spotted these two ducks swimming to the edge of this little pond and I immediately recognized that there was a photo here and this skill will come with time but basically I realized that the water was calm and flat, we had beautiful green reflections and the two birds had positioned themselves in a way that I thought hey that would make a nice photo. So I've got myself down low, I've gone towards the ducks, I've laid down and I've turned the camera on where I've hit the shutter button and I had the settings that I was previously using with some other ducks and I immediately noticed that the image was just too dark and it was actually underexposed. Now if I take the photo we had an ISO of 2500 so remember that 2500 it was too dark so I've gone to the exposure compensation and I've made it brighter and it ended up having an ISO of 6400. So I want to ask you a question the first shot had ISO 2500 the second shot had ISO 6400. Which one do you think has more noise? 2500 or 6400? It's a bit of a trick question. <laughs> if you said they're probably roughly the same, you would be right. If you said 6400 we would have way more noise, unfortunately you'd be wrong and I'll explain why that is. When we take a shot that is underexposed, so that ISO 2500 shot, it was too dark. It was at least a stop too dark. So what do we have to do? To make it brighter in post we have to add a stop. So when we add a stop we have to add a stop to the ISO. So ISO 2500 becomes 5000. So the correct ISO for that shot was ISO 5000, not 2500, 5000. The second shot that I took at 6400 it was actually a little bit too bright. Now if I dialed back that exposure it goes back to sort of ISO 5000. So technically they both have the same amount of noise or very close to it especially if your sensor is ISO invariant which means that it doesn't really matter what ISO you set it's always going to have roughly the same amount of noise and when we compare them in Lightroom you can see with the exposure adjusted it's pretty hard to tell the difference in the amount of noise between the two images and you can see one of them is clearly 2500 at the time we took the shot and the other one's 6400 but they have the same amount of noise. And this might blow some people's minds you might get a little bit confused by this because we've always been told the ISO number dictates how much noise you have and that's not completely accurate. It has more to do with how much light is coming in through your shutter speed and your aperture. The ISO is just the brightness of it. Now the important part is to try to get your exposure as accurate as possible because this will give you a true reflection of what the ISO is. So if we correctly expose it at ISO 5000 then that's the amount of noise we can expect. However if we continually underexpose at say ISO 2500 or ISO 1600 we think oh we've got to keep that ISO number low it's kind of a disservice to yourself because that's not how much noise is going to be in your image. So if you're constantly underexposing your images you're actually going to have always have more noise when you increase the exposure because your ISO is actually higher. Hopefully that made sense but just be aware that if you want to reduce the amount of noise in your images you have to reduce the shutter speed or open up that aperture to actually let more light hit the sensor. That's how we reduce the noise and I wanted to do that. So I had 1 500th of a second, these birds were static and I thought why don't I try 1 320th of a second which is really slow. However those birds aren't moving, I was on a tripod I have IS, I'm pretty confident I was going to get sharp shots at that. So I've dialed in 1 320th of a second, we've taken some photos and I actually really like this photo I took of the female, beautiful and if we look at the raw files and we look at the noise, now we've got one image that's ISO 4000 but has a 1 320th of a second and the other image has 1 500th of a second and ISO 2500. So the image with the higher ISO number actually has less noise in it because it had that lower shutter speed. Confused? Hopefully not, but it's all to do with the exposure, not necessarily that ISO number. Now I did like this image of this female with the male behind it, but you'll notice that the male is out of focus. 
that's because our depth of field was too narrow. So with these big long lenses, we have fairly shallow depth of field. It means I've focused on the female and the male was outside that focal plane, so that was out of focus. And that's fine if that's the look you're going for. However, if I want both birds sharp, how am I going to do that? Well, you can simply just put the focus point on the female, take a few shots, move the focus point to the male, then get the male in focus and take a few photos. And then using post-processing, we can actually overlap those two images using masks in Photoshop. We can now make the image look like it was just one single image. Both birds are sharp and we have this image. I'm curious to know which one you prefer. Let me know in the comments. Do you like the image with the blurry second bird or do you like the image with them both sharp? Love to hear your opinion. Okay, so after I finished with those ducks, the sun actually came up over the horizon and we had glorious sunlight hitting the lake and hitting the grass. And I'll quickly want to demonstrate just what a difference this light makes to your ISO and your IQ and how much light hits the sensor of the camera. So on the screen here, I pointed the camera at some grass that was bathed in glorious sunlight. Look in the bottom right hand corner, we have an ISO of 320. That tells me that we're actually going to have very little amount of noise, we're going to have really good image quality, that's fantastic. However, as I pan the camera into the shadows, look what happens to that ISO. As soon as we go into the shadow, there's just not enough light to expose the photo and that ISO shoots up to ISO 5000, which is significantly higher. I think it's about four stops um, higher than it is at ISO 320. What does that mean? It means in the shadows, we only have one sixteenth the amount of light that we had in the sun. And you can imagine what that means for your image quality and your photos and your noise. The shot in the shadows it's going to have way more noise and there's no way really to get up around that. So you just need to be prepared and be aware when you're shooting in low light, you are probably going to struggle a little bit with your noise unless you have a really slow shutter speed and a very fast aperture. So as I was laying down photographing some ducks, the kookaburras actually flew in and it landed in a tree not far from me. I've quickly moved the lens up to the kookaburra and it filled the frame. I was just way too close. There should be something obvious to you that I saw when I put the camera onto the kookaburra. Can you see what it is? Yep, it's just way too bright. The chest of that bird is glowing. It's going to be overexposed. If I took a photo there, the whites would be gone. I would have blown the whites. So I need to control that somehow. I need to turn down the brightness. So we've just adjusted the exposure compensation. We've made it a little bit darker. Therefore, we're no longer blowing those whites in the bird. So those whites were just way too hot. We've made the image darker. So now that the whites aren't blowing and our histogram is not hitting that right hand side. And that's an issue whenever we're changing from one scene to another, we need to check our exposure to make sure that we're not overexposing or heavily underexposing. So I've managed to get that in control. We've got the exposure right. Now you'll notice that I have changed a couple of things here. We've changed the aperture from 5.6 wide open to 7.1. We've made it a little bit narrower and you might be going, why are you doing that? Why are you restricting the amount of light coming in? There's a couple of reasons. The first is as we narrow our aperture or that aperture number gets bigger, our depth of field gets bigger. And when I've got such a narrow depth of field with that big lens, I like to have a little bit more depth of field so we have a bit more of the bird in focus. So generally I go with 7.1 or f8. So I've dialed in 7.1. And the other second reason is some lenses are sharper stop down. So especially with a teleconverter, I just like to stop it down a little bit to try and increase the maximum sharpness. So you'll also notice that I set the shutter speed to 1 800th of a second for the kookaburra. And you might be going, well, Dwayne, that's way too high for a static bird. Don't you want to reduce the ISO? And technically, yes, you could. We could have used a lot of shutter speed. However, for me, there's no real difference between ISO 100 and ISO 400 on these modern bodies. I would much rather a higher shutter speed because I'm likely to get less soft shots due to motion blur than a really low ISO. So I very rarely ever shoot below ISO 400 with wildlife because I would much rather those higher shutter speeds. So even though my shutter speed was 800th of a second, we're at 7.1, the ISO was still extremely low, so I had no issue whatsoever. I'd much rather let that shutter speed climb the more light that we get. So now we had our settings dialed in, we had our shutter speed, our aperture, our ISO was set. I just now had to wait for the bird to change position. The current position, we had sticks over the beak and over the face. It's not an ideal shot and it's probably not one I would ever take a photo of. However, for this demonstration, I've waited. The bird has turned its head. We've initiated eye focus. You can see the little blue box on the eye and we managed to get this headshot, which is exposed correctly and FV mode allowed me to do that. However, if I wanted to take a shot of this kookaburra, like a portrait of the entire bird, what am I going to do? What I can do is change the orientation into portrait mode 
and now we can see that we can see more of the bird but it's still way too tight. So here's a tip of what you can do, it doesn't always work but it's worth trying in the field, is to actually take multiple photos around that bird and then merge them in post like you would with a landscape. So with the Canon bodies, with the eye tracking, I've just initiated eye tracking so that autofocus is going to stick to the bird's eye and then I've just moved the camera around taking photos. Ultimately I ended up with six different photos and I've just used Photo Merge and Lightroom which has merged those images together and it's given us this final raw image. I can then crop that to how I want, edit it, process it and we end up with this image. So you know ultimately even though I was too close, I had too much focal length, I was still able to get a full length shot just by using that technique. So it might be worth trying next time you're out in the field. Okay let's move on to my final example and it's those beautiful wood ducks again. I was laying there photographing some different ducks when these two birds started swimming towards me and I tracked the male for a little while and then I noticed the female had actually come quite close. So I've moved the lens and we've gone on to the female and it's immediately started tracking her. I noticed it was a little bit dark so I've actually increased the exposure compensation. Now I was using a higher shutter speed at one 12 50th of a second and the aperture at f8 for the reasons I mentioned with the kookaburra we had so much light I'd much rather have a slightly narrower aperture and a higher shutter speed to increase the IQ and the birds swam past us and we managed to get this beautiful side profile the detail is excellent the reflection's great the color's great I love everything about it except it was too tight again I would much prefer much more space around the bird but again I had just too much focal length so that image worked well once I'd finished photographing the female, the male has then swum around through some reeds. I've moved over, initiated the eye tracking, it's gone to the eye of the duck and we've just rattled off some shots as it swum past. And again, great detail, great IQ, great background. I like the inclusion of those reeds in this shot. Again, we're too tight. But that's simply all I was doing was just in the field. I've got FE mode on. I can change the different settings if I need to. I increase the shutter speed, decrease the shutter speed, change the exposure compensation. Quite intuitive for me. I didn't really have too many issues out in the field and it resulted in a nice successful morning with some really good shots. All right, so that brought my morning session to an end. Just in conclusion, I think you could pick up from that session I had that FE mode worked extremely well for me. I was able to change the settings easily on the fly just using the rear dial and the front dial. And I hopefully it showed you how important reading the ambient light is and understanding that the ambient light or the strength of the light is going to directly dictate the quality of your shots and how you need to adapt to that. You might be going, well, I never know what settings to use. And I know it's confusing. However, with time, with experience, it will come to you. You'll get to know what shutter speeds and apertures you need to use for the kit that you're using. It all has to do with time, experience, failing a lot, trying again and figuring it out that way. So what I'd love is for you to share your experience with me in the comments. If you use FV mode, let me know what you like, what you don't like, especially if you don't like it. I'd love to know why you don't like FV mode. For those that haven't tried it, I encourage you to go and try it and then jump into the comments later after you've used it. Let me know how you went on. Do you like it or don't you like it? I read all the comments. I might not be able to answer them all, but I really, really appreciate it. I definitely read them all and appreciate the community that we've got here. I reckon it's amazing. Now, I want to thank especially all the new members that have joined the channel and the existing members. If you're not aware, for the price of less than a cup of coffee per month, you can directly support the channel. You get a cool little bird emoji next to your name and you also get access to the 2023 digital calendar that can go on your laptop, your tablet or your PC. It's got 4K, really high quality images. As soon as you become a member, you can download that for free at no extra cost. Thanks to everyone who's subscribed to the channel. It's gone well past my expectations and uh, happy birding. Enjoy yourself out there. Take care and we'll see you in the next one. See you later. You're all right, mate. You're all right. How are you? What a beautiful dog you've got. Hello. Oh, I'd love to have a cuddle if that's all right. Hello. Hello. That's all right. Hello. Oh, aren't you a big, beautiful boy? Oh, look at you. A face only mum could love or not? Yeah. No? No? Others love you too, I'm sure. Yeah, no. Mate of mine. Ugliest dog in the world. You know. <laughs> I quite like the tan, the tricolour, like yeah. as opposed to the white. Yeah. Happy. Yeah. G'day, mate. How are you?